Um, good morning. My name is Allison Barkoff, and I'm the Acting Administrator and Assistant Secretary for Aging at the Administration for Community Living. And I really want to thank everybody for coming today and helping us mark this important moment for caregiving. Today, we're taking the first major step in implementing the Recognized, Assist, Include, Support, and Engage, or RAISE, Family Caregiver Act. The RAISE Family Caregiver Act authorized the creation of the RAISE Family Caregiving Council, Ad Advisory Council, comprised of family members and experts to work in collaboration with partners from across the federal government to develop an initial report to Congress identifying the major issues facing family caregivers and a set of initial recommendations followed by the subsequent development and submission to Congress of a national family caregiving strategy. We're thrilled to be sharing with you today information about the RAISE Family Caregiving Advisory Council's initial, initial report, which we'll be formally submitting to Congress tomorrow. This report comes at a time when the issue of supporting caregivers is front and center. The last 18 months of the COVID pandemic has shown a spotlight on the importance of family caregiving and how family caregivers too often have to step in to fill the gaps in our long-term care system, gaps that have been exacerbated throughout the pandemic. At the same time, COVID-19 has laid bare the risks of living in institutional and congregate settings, making the work to support family caregivers and filling the gaps in formal care that help people remain in their own homes and communities even more urgent. That's why caregiving is the centerpiece and one of the centerpieces of President Biden's Build Back Better plan and an issue that Congress is focused on literally as we speak. The fragility of our caregiving system has finally become visible to the public eye with nearly daily stories in the media. And for the folks from the media who are on, thank you. Thank you for those important stories. There are 53 million family caregivers in America. And at any given time, one of seven of us serve as a caregiver. Today's report describes who those caregivers are and they include children and teen caregivers. Throughout the work of the Family Caregiving Advisory Council, we are giving voice to family caregivers and addressing the Biden-Harris administration priority of strengthening the caregiving infrastructure. The report underscores the needs caregivers have for training, support, and opportunities for rest and self-care. It details lost income, increased stress, and greater social isolation that many family caregivers face. The report also shines a light on the many positive aspects of family caregiving, including the tremendous satisfaction and feelings of accomplishment that many experience. The report being released to Congress draws heavily on the more than 1,600 comments submitted by caregivers, caregiving advocates, and other stakeholders. And this report, for the first time, analyzes caregiving efforts across the federal government, including throughout the Departments of Health and Human Services, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, AmeriCorps, and the Departments of Education, Labor, and Veterans Affairs. As you'll hear momentarily during presentations by the council co-chairs, co we've learned a lot about caregiving and we are poised to take the next crucial step, developing a national caregiver strategy. ACL is committed to moving expeditiously. A national caregiving strategy is long overdue and we must seize this moment where there is a focus on strengthening the caregiving infrastructure. We plan to leverage our relationships with our sister federal agencies to move forward with the development of the national caregiver strategy now. And we'll begin by engaging with our federal partners, followed by completing other components next year. I'm confident the result will be a strategy that will fundamentally change the way our nation views and supports caregivers. 
Turning back to the initial report that we'll be delivering to Congress tomorrow, it is the result of robust partnerships and collaborations. ACL is grateful to the John A. Hartford Foundation and their grant to the National Academy for State Health Policy, which resulted in the establishment of the Reyes Family Caregiving Resource and Dissemination Center. This collaboration between ACL, John A. Hartford and NASHP and their subgrantees at the National Alliance for Caregiving, University of Massachusetts, Boston, and Community Catalyst is an example of public-private partnership at its best. The contributions of each of these organizations has been valuable, and I wanna thank each of them for their support. Now I'd like to share a short recorded presentation by the three council co-chairs, Dr. Alan Stevens, Nancy Murray, and Dr. Casey Schillem. They'll walk us through an overview of the contents of the report and share with you some of the underlying philosophies and thinking behind its creation. Welcome everyone. I'm Nancy Murray, Senior Vice President at Achieva and President of the Arc of Greater Pittsburgh. I am also a co-chair of the Family Caregiving Advisory Council most importantly, I'm a family caregiver. Along with my council co-chairs, Alan Stevens and Casey Shillman, and on behalf of our fellow council members, we are very excited to present this overview of the Family Caregiving Advisory Council's initial report to Congress. As you can see on our first slide, 53 million people in America are family caregivers. And while this is very rewarding work, caregiving often impacts a caregiver's physical, emotional, and financial well being. But family caregivers are the backbone of care in the United States, but unfortunately not adequately supported by federal, state, or local policies, or by health care providers and employers. And unbelievably, the economic value of family caregivers is estimated at $470 billion every year, which is more than the United States spends annually on all long-term services and supports. Now this report comes at a pivotal time in our nation's history. The Reyes Act is the culmination of 20 years of advocacy and legislation on behalf of family caregivers. It is the latest federal recognition of the importance of supporting family caregivers as a critical component of the long-term services and support system. In fact, there would be no system without family caregivers. What is so unique and groundbreaking about the RAISE Act is that when fully implemented, it will result in the first comprehensive national strategy for better supporting family caregivers. So the report that we're discussing today, which will be delivered to Congress and the rest of the country tomorrow, is the culmination of two years of intense heartfelt work by my fellow council members and with significant input from hundreds of individuals and stakeholders around the country. And now I'd like to introduce Alan Stevens. Hello, I'm Alan Stevens. I'm the director of the Center for Applied Health Research at Baylor Scott and White Health. But today I'm come to you as one of the co-chairs of the Family Caregiver, Caregiving Advisory Council. When the council first came together in August of 2019, we knew our task was of great significance import and importance. The council is comprised of a diverse group of individuals from all over the country. I can, I think I can safely say that I speak for my fellow council members that we didn't take our work lightly, not even from day one, and the notion that this would, would not be easy. We recognize that this would not be easy from uh, the beginning. We knew that because our life experiences have taught us so. Many of us had come out of a caregiving experience or indeed we're still caregiving. So we knew that caregivers had many needs 
they were diverse, and importantly, the needs were growing and growing rapidly. We, the non-federal appointed members of the council, um, were also realized that representatives from a number of federal agencies shared our dedication uh, to improving the caregiving experience. These representatives from the federal agencies brought forth a wealth of knowledge that helped shape our discussion and motivated the council to think boldly, think boldly about what a caregiving strategy would look like for our country. Without question, family caregiving is, is an intensely personal uh, situation and every family story is unique. But with that, the council was able to come together and decide early on, uh, on what are some of the common themes that, that really bring caregivers together and that they share. Listed on the slide here, I mentioned caregiving is a significantly personal uh, event and indeed involves caregiving for someone who you have a deep personal relationship with. Caregivers step forward to care for the individuals for which they have these significant relationships in order to help the person that's requiring care maintain their dignity, independence, and overall quality of life. Caregivers do this with very little help from others. And in fact, without any kind of formal assessment for to help them guide them of what their needs are or where they can seek out other forms of support. Caregiving is also becoming intensely more complex. Individuals report uh, that they're often are doing medical tasks and nursing tasks that they had not had to do in the, in the past. Um, thus, caregiving is becoming even more complex. And lastly, Research has taught us, our personal experiences have taught us, working in our communities have taught us that caregivers can have, caregiving can have a financial and emotional and indeed a physical uh, um, challenge or a consequence to the one who is providing care. Next slide. The work of the council would not be complete without the support of a number of other individuals who brought forth an additional perspective, additional information, and indeed helped guide the debates that we had as a council. I particularly want to thank the John A. Hartford Foundation uh, for their funding and the establishment of the Ray's Family Caregiver Resource and, and Dissemination Center and the National Academy of State Health Policy, who worked uh, with uh, agencies across the country to make sure that the voice of the caregiver was heard and included in this report. Next slide, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Schillam. Thank you, Alan. I'm Casey Schillam. I am Dean and Professor of the University of Portland School of Nursing. And as my co-chairs have also mentioned, today I'm here as a co-chair of the Family Caregiving Advisory Council. So after two years of careful deliberation and study and collaboration, we are so proud to deliver this report to Congress. This report includes everything the RAISE Act called to include and more. The council heard directly from caregivers with a variety of experiences. Um, we engaged in extensive analysis and discussions, and we reviewed countless resources. So I'm going to provide an overview of those for you in just a moment. But these were really looking at, at resources that are already in place that support family caregivers. And ultimately, we developed a comprehensive set of recommendations. So the next slide actually helps us to understand some of the things that went into these decisions and these areas. So when we look at the caregiver voices, we have an incredible opportunity for us to actually hear the stories of the caregivers who have informed these recommendations. 
there were uh, a number of calls that came out for information sessions and we had five different council members include their statements and there were statements from caregivers in tribal communities and so caregiver voices really were the driving force behind the work that we've done as a council some of the things that we looked at in terms of analysis and that we had extensive discussions and debates and, and great conversations about in, in terms of the importance of this work, looking at youth caregivers, those who are still under the age of 18 needing to provide care for their family members and the impact that has on them in their own growth and development, looking at international efforts to support family caregivers, understanding that family caregivers, caregiving that happens in tribal communities often is very different than what we may see in other communities and thinking about supports that are necessary for that specific group and, and how we can support them. And also looking at challenges faced by family caregivers. We had numerous presentations, sources of data where we were able to hear firsthand the challenges that caregivers are facing in addition to the experiences that all of us as council members have had in our own family caregiving. We went through a number of different sources of data looking at um, analysis of multiple scholarly papers that had been presented, research, looking at Medicare and Medicaid services, advocacy work, also thinking about the importance of the Medicaid white paper that was provided by our colleagues at NASHP, and also looking at a full federal inventory of the resources that currently exist, but also identifying how those resources may not necessarily be um, easily communicated to those who need the services the most. And at the end, the culmination that we have in this report is now 26 recommendations that will serve as a framework and a bedrock of support for moving forward with an, a full-fledged caregiving strategy. So perhaps the most unique aspect of this report is that throughout the document, readers will have a direct link to real family caregivers telling their stories. You can see three of the um, amazing photos here of the family caregivers who shared their very personal and impactful stories with us. And so as you read the report, you'll get to meet 25 incredible family caregivers and they come from all over the country. They represent a broad and varied representation of family caregivers throughout our society. As I just mentioned, we have youth providing care. We have older adults providing care for children. We have a full range of representation in these videos and they are indeed powerful. They have supported loved ones with terminal illness, dementia, other long-term care conditions, and they've supported parents, spouses, children, and they highlight their stories in a unique way, and they're, but yet they were joined in many ways across several common themes, and that's what has informed the recommendations. So this report, like so many others of its kind, really is a forward-looking report in scope and approach. So most importantly, it offers these key priority areas on which we must focus. And we believe that this is a strong pathway through these 26 recommended areas for action that will inform the development of a national caregiving, national family caregiving strategy. So the recommendations that we as a council adopted really fall into five broad priority areas. So these are increasing the awareness of family caregiving, increasing the emphasis on integrating the caregiver into the process and the systems from which they've been traditionally excluded. So family caregivers have not been included as a part of the care team. And that is one of the strongest recommendations that we have. We're also recommending that there are increased access, um, it, we, that we increase access to services and to supports to assist family caregivers, that we increase the financial and the workplace protections for caregivers. And finally, we are recommending that we need to have better and more consistent research and data collection to truly understand the impact that family caregiving is having on the health and wellness of our entire country. And so in short order, we'll be able to turn our attention into developing these recommendations into an actual strategy. So fortunately, we have the leadership of the ACL and the support of an amazing team at Nashby 
who with the funding from the John A. Hartford Foundation will continue to ensure that we have the tools and the information that we need to take information approached in this important um, information as we approach this important work. And so um, the report really is this first step and it is helping us with implementing the charge of the RAISE Act. And so the recommendations are gonna be critical for creating that family caregiving strategy at a national level, national in scope and national in focus. So it's going to encompass actions that the federal government can take within their existing authorities, as well as concrete strategies for states, for communities, healthcare providers, the system of healthcare, employers, philanthropy, and other sectors. The strategy is gonna be rooted in, and it's gonna speak directly to the recommendations of this report. And like so much of the report, the strategy will be heavily informed by input from the public, including the family caregivers and those who advocate for and support them. When completed later next year, this strategy is gonna serve as a living and evolving roadmap for change, for better recognizing, assisting, including supporting and engaging family caregivers as the critical partners they are, as we all are as family caregivers in how we support people of all ages across the care continuum who have needs. So now we would like to go ahead and open up and welcome any questions or insights that you would like to share with the council. Thank you so much to our uh, co-chairs for that great summary. And as we just heard, one of the things that is most compelling about this report is the voice it gives to family caregivers. And that's not something that we typically see in government reports. As we just heard throughout the document, you'll see and hear 25 family caregivers share their stories. These family caregivers represent both the diversity of the situations of caregivers across America and also the commonalities of their joys and challenges. These testimonials breathe life into and make concrete the need for each of these recommendations. And we have a short video of compilations of these stories that we'd like to share with you now. Our culture, at least in my family, is that we care for folks at home. And um, that's hard. My values as a Native American, that's one of the values that is instilled in us is to care for your elders. I didn't fully understand or embrace what it meant to be a caregiver um, until way, way, way late. I don't know that I would have said the word caregiver at the time. And I don't think I even knew the word advocate at the time, but I knew that I was in some special place. I had somebody who actually approached me and just started asking questions about how I was feeling and what was going on. And I think the light bulb went off and it's like, oh, you know what? There are other people out there that are feeling the same way that I am. Kimmy came home from the hospital, and for them, so oh, it's done. Well, not really. It actually just began for us, right? Josh needs 24-hour hands-on care. You can't just sleep, think you're going to sleep. He needs suctioning constantly. He's on 24-hour feedings. He needs to be turned. He's on an oximeter 24 hours. I mean, it's not like you can just say it's time to go to bed. It, it's not like that at all. That's the big challenge for me as, as the caregiver is I've got someone who's got some very, very serious cancer um, who I believe requires 24-hour care. The services and supports that I was trying to desperately to put in place for her, um, as soon as I would get a level of service in place for her, she would, um, her needs would exceed that level of service. So it, it felt a bit like being on a hamster wheel. I mean, I, I wasn't sleeping. Um, I wasn't going to the doctor for myself, surely not. Um, I wasn't taking time for any breaks to restore myself. 
I'm physically tired. Sometimes I get overwhelmed. Um, a couple years back, three months ago, I started to get sick. I had my first anxiety attack, so that was new for me, and um, that was something I've never experienced before. We never, we never took a vacation for the 25 years, because we never, we never thought it was going to be 25 years, right? I've struggled with my own mental health and seeing how my grandpa is kind of puts more weight on me sometimes. And, uh, you know, I try to talk about it and it could be hard sometimes. And I think it's not just me. I know it's not just me. There's lots of other people who are going through that issue. A lot of us are compromising on both our earnings and our retirement. I'm still paying off uh, month by month those medical loans that I that I took out for her, which I did so gladly. Um, but you know, it's it's long term financial implications now, even four plus years after her death. I've used up you know what I had from 401ks to stock options. Caregiving is a very expensive experience. I didn't put my career um, on hold. I I just jumped right out of my career and didn't have a plan for getting back in at all um, and didn't realize initially how caregiving was going to financially impact me. There's more to us than the one story. We, we don't want to end up at that destination where people say, well, I don't know anything about, I was never taught anything about caregiving, so uh, you know what, um, someone else has to do it. You're gonna get sick, your family members are gonna get sick, your kids might get sick. That is a given. So given that that's going to happen, why do we not have a solution for how to help people? Thank you so much for that video. It, it is just really compelling to hear directly from caregivers. And I'd like to now introduce two of the family caregivers featured in the report. Um, first, Debbie. And great, Debbie, thanks so much for, for being here with us today and for sharing your caregiving journey. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. For you, it seems that the council's priorities of increasing awareness of family caregivers and improving access to services and supports for them is critical. Can you say a few words about that? I can. I, I think um, just having the benefit of years of experience with our son, Josh, who is now 28 years old, um, I've been able to see situations change over the years. Josh has complex medical needs. And so he is one of those, I can say, kids who came along at a time where um, he's the first generation um, with such complex needs to actually live this long um, because of medical technology. And in the beginning, um, there were supports that were provided from you know, our insurance plan. But I think as um, it was seen how expensive that was to provide like nursing care and all of the equipment that was essential for his life, um, those things kind of faded away as time went on. Um, and then you begin to rely on other supports, for example, maybe from state and federal, but then those began to kind of fall by the wayside as well. And so um, I think um, we need to have people become more aware of the details of our stories and what it takes to um, allow even our complex kids who also have disabilities possibly like Josh um, to not just survive in their homes and communities, but to thrive as well. Um, Josh might have a lot to contend with, but he's an absolutely wonderful, amazing young man. And so, um, and our family has really rallied, including his brothers, um, to make certain that he's included as part of our family and he's an essential part of our family. And so um, I think the, the, the issue is just learning about him and learning about us 
and seeing how amazing it is, but also what it takes to run this machine and to do this and, and to um, be more empathetic about it. So, um, and that starts at the federal level, it goes to the state level, it requires, um, you know, opening up waiting lists for waivers. Um, it, it, it requires um, insurance providers to be aware of the nursing care needs uh, for families like ours, because eventually, you know, after 28 years, you're a little older and not able to stay up. You know, I used to kind of boast about being able to stay up from Tuesday till Friday, <laughs> um, especially when my husband, um, who was a career Marine, was deployed to Iraq twice. And I was, um, we lost our nursing coverage because he was also, um, he had a civilian job as well. And um, we lost our nursing during that, that time for his first deployment. And so um, as you get older though, you're not able to sustain that kind of, of care. And so um, I think we have to be aware that life happens as well. And um, families are going to have to have the supports they need to um, also take care of other uh, situations in life while they provide the care, long-term care for their uh, children with complex needs. Thank you, Debbie, for, for sharing your story. Mm -hmm. um, next, I wanna call on Sarah, another caregiver who was uh, highlighted. Sarah, welcome and thank you for your insights about how we can truly assist and support family caregivers. The caregiving situation you face highlighted the needs for strengthening financial security for family caregivers. Can you share a little more about that? Yes, I worked as a school administrator for over 20 years, but became a full-time caregiver when my husband, Paul, was diagnosed with younger onset Alzheimer's disease. He was an engineer analyst with the Department of Defense, but he had to leave his job when he could no longer keep classified and unclassified documents straight. Before his um, early retirement, we uh, were both entering the peak of our earning years and just starting to think about putting away extra money for retirement because our three children had finished college. <clears throat> but navigating the financial hardship of both of us retiring early and increased healthcare and caregiving costs have really put up roadblocks for us. Additionally, I'm a caregiver for my mother. My parents started out their married lives as uh, tenant farmers or sharecroppers, and they worked really hard to uh, sometimes working two jobs in order to become landowners. And they were very proud of their family farm and the legacy they were leaving, uh, my brothers and I. Uh, but because they worked hard and saved and prospered, uh, my mother's health care costs now are exorbitant and she is paying uh, a, a huge amount for services that other folks receive at low or no cost. Now uh, she has entered care, long-term care, because her care needs are greater than what I can provide and still care for my husband. So I am in danger of losing the family farm. Um, if I had any financial support at all uh, for my contributions as a caregiver, it would be a tremendous help to my family and help preserve the farm that my parents worked so hard for, which is my family's legacy for my children and grandchildren. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing your story. I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, Kelly Matt to open it up for questions from the media. Good afternoon, everyone. If you have a question, can you raise your hand or type it into the chat for us? We'll give you a moment to uh, think about that. I have a question from Liz Siegert. She's asking, what action can the administration take right now while this report goes through the bureaucratic process in Congress? Dr. Stevens or Nancy Murray, would you like to respond? 
Sure, Kelly. Um, I think right now what we're asking of the administration is that everyone take very seriously the recommendations that are in this report and that members of Congress do the same and that uh, funding is available through some of uh, President Biden administration uh, initiatives. Uh, you know, as we've heard uh, this morning already, um, family caregiving is an issue that existed before the COVID pandemic, certainly uh, worsened during the pandemic. Um, and I think it's also worth reminding people that uh, replacing family caregiving on an annual basis would cost the United States of America about $470 billion. That is more than the system, than the nation's system of long-term services and institutional services combined. The United States cannot do without family caregivers. So that is why we are um, urging, very seriously urging uh, members of Congress and the administration to uh, accept these recommendations and to authorize the funding so that we can start implementing them. Thank you. Uh, yes, I completely agree with my colleague, uh, Nancy Murray, um, and that things can be done now. Some things are, as she said, already on the table. I think our report when released tomorrow will also identify areas in which federal agencies are already uh, contributing to family caregiving services. And that could be looked at as well as another area in which there is an infrastructure, an existing infrastructure from which programs could grow and grow quickly as the need is growing quickly uh, on, our, on our family caregivers. But uh, let me stop and, and, and give Debbie uh, and uh, Sarah a chance to respond as well. Um, I, I think one of the things that can be done right now is to recognize uh, special situations that caregivers face. For example, um, Josh has very nuanced medical conditions, so he's not textbook. And going through the crisis that we're going through now with COVID, for example, um, the, Josh just uh, was very sick and was in the ICU um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, very unexpected and um, he they have very of course res restrictive visiting policies and um, there's a, a shortage right now in um, uh, med peds uh, physicians and and care coordination for transitional care for youth um, who are transitioning from uh, the specialty uh, pediatric uh, <clears throat> um, Medic uh, medical uh, clinics to adult um, to care for these uh, for for young adults who have been in, in uh, pediatrics and specialty care for so many years and they're difficult to hand over and so we this was our first time having to go <clears throat> excuse me into an adult <clears throat> I'm so sorry into an adult um, hospital system but we had to do it on an emergency basis. And Josh is nonverbal, he's vocal, but he was very sick. He couldn't be responsive at all as he typically is. But the visiting policies did not at all acknowledge a patient like him. And so um, he has never ever been left alone in his life in a hospital system. Um, and we were asking for ADA um, compliance. Um, so that someone could be with him 24 hours a day, because even treating him um, is very nuanced. And so um, they were very, very um, accepting of our requests after a while, but we had to continue um, to kind of implore them uh, through various shifts. But I think just on a federal level, um, just somehow um, indicating that um, that needs to be done to have an awareness for people who are different, um, who have disabilities as well as complex needs and to allow caregivers um, to have a voice and say, 
this needs to be done for my loved one. Um, it's, it's essential to listen to caregivers. It's essential because they know best. They're the constant in that person's life and they know best and can um, actually help in the treatment um, and the more positive outcome for that individual. Thank you. Sarah, did you have a, a comment on the question? Well, I, I agree with Debbie. I think caregivers are somewhat marginalized. Uh, I think we, we need recognition that we, we have some expertise uh, with, with the folks that we are caring for. And um, there's not a lot of, of, of training, of supports, uh, particularly if you have um, resources. Um, so I, I, I would say to, to the current administration that we need a sense of urgency um, and we need uh, a sense uh, that that we are valued partners in the healthcare system. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Abby Abrams with Time Magazine. And I'm going to uh, ask uh, Administrator Barkoff to address. The question is, would some of the provisions in the reconciliation package going through Congress right now help family caregivers? Thanks, Kelly. And um, one thing that's been so exciting about uh, sitting in this position right now, as I mentioned earlier, is the focus on family caregiving that's in the Better Care, Better Jobs Act that is um, impacting the scope of the reconciliation package. In particular, the Better Care, Better Jobs Act proposal to expand home and community-based services is key to supporting family caregivers. As you'll see in the, in the report from the council, there's both a focus on families are having to step in because they can't access those long-term services and supports. As we heard from Debbie, people sitting on wait lists, waiting for services are unable to fill critical positions. Um, a second part that's really important that we are watching closely in the reconciliation bill is expanding paid family and sick leave. And that's a key issue for many caregivers who either aren't eligible for a paid leave or it doesn't cover their situations. Um, and just to add to the last question, um, the administration was involved and worked closely with the American Rescue Plan. And in the American Rescue Plan is what President Biden called just a down payment uh, on expanding home and community-based services. And that included an, um, a increased federal match for home and community-based services. And HHS is implementing that and states are able to use that funding for a wide variety of activities, including supports to family caregivers, including things like Sarah talked about, um, being able to pay family caregivers who have had to step in and fill those roles, as well as to provide things like training and outreach support and respite care. So those are all really important things that have already started uh, through actions by the administration. And we are looking closely and following the, the big proposals that are part of the reconciliation. And I'll open it up to others from the committee to, to add to that. I, I will add uh, <clears throat> from a perspective of what is home and uh, uh, home and community services, and why is that important? We use that term a lot, but I don't think we always connect the dots. Essential to the fam to a family caregiver's uh, main goal is to promote the independence and the community living uh, of the person requiring care. Put simply, people like to stay at home, and people and families like to provide care within their own home. So that's an essential element of family caregiving is home-based care. But we can't do that to, uh, at the cost of literally 
trapping or restricting the family caregiver uh, into the home too much. So we need to promote the idea of independence and independent living within the home for the person requiring care, but also keep in mind that the caregiver's autonomy and need for social uh, socialization and indeed perhaps even working outside the home is an element of that autonomy. Home and community services take the broader view of, of providing that care in a way to achieve both. Autonomy for the caregiver, some free time for the caregiver, and home-based care for the person requiring uh, care from the family member. Thanks so much. Uh, do we have any uh, additional questions from the media? Just want to uh, say that Dr. Alan Stevens, Nancy Murray, and our caregivers, Debbie and Sarah, as well as ACL Administrator Allison Barkaw, are all able to answer questions at this time. You can unmute yourself and ask or place a question in chat. All right, we are going to turn it back to Administrator Barkoff for the close. Thank you Great. very much. Thanks, Kelly. Um, thank you everyone from the media for attending today for um, really all the work that you've been doing over the last several months, lifting up the voices of caregivers, lifting up this issue. We are hopeful you will find the report that we've shared with you um, helpful and, and useful, and we hope that you can help lift up the important issues that the caregivers today shared. Thanks again for joining us, and uh, we'll look forward to reading your stories.